I think we're probably going to start now. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Yehuda Michael. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, to celebrate the International Day of Education. Uh, to commemorate the day, we prepared an online lecture titled Strengthening uh, Cultural Identity and Promoting Empathy in Early Childhood. Uh, this lecture will describe the theory and guiding principles of early childhood intercultural education focused on persona dolls approach. Before we start, I want to go to uh, through some logistics. Uh, we're recording this meeting and later on put the recording on our YouTube channel. If you do not want to be recorded, please turn off your camera. Um, also, if you have any question for our lecturer, please write them down in the chat section and we will uh, come into them at the end of the lecture. Uh, and thank you. Now I would like to invite uh, Ms. Julie Corzon Van Gelder, a Director in Planning, Evaluation and Partnership at Ms. Shav to say a few words. Uh, Julie, please. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good morning, wherever you may be. I would like to thank you on behalf of Masha for joining us on this special day. My name is Shuli Kersen van Gelder and I'm the Director of Planning, Evaluation and Partnerships in Masha, Israel's Agency for International Development Cooperation. In recent years, we have started a tradition of marking international days that are relevant to Masha activities and today we are marking the International Day of Education. International Day of Education is a day that focuses this year on changing course, transforming education. It's, it's an emphasis on the balancing system between people and their surroundings. In the Bible, it's written that train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So thank you again. And I would like to thank Professor Margalit Ziv that is joining us and is going to lecture today. Thank you for joining us. And I hope you'll enjoy this day. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shuli. Thank you for your opening remarks. Um, uh, now I would like to invite uh, MCTC Director Ms. Sarah Williams to say a few words. Sarah, please. Thank you very much, Yehuda, and thank you, Shuli. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us on this very important day, International Day of Education. Um, as uh, the Mashab Carmel Training Center, uh, we are a center under the auspices of Mashab, Israel's Agency for International Development Cooperation. We are really proud to be with you today and to host Professor Margaret Ziv um, on this special day. And what a better, what better way to celebrate International Day of Education than to emphasize the importance of early childhood education and this importance of when we have the most influence and the you know, this is the most important part of someone's life. Um, I'm really proud to be here and to be with you all today. And I really wish you all a wonderful International Day of Education. And I would like to give a very big thank you to uh, Professor Margalit Ziv and also to Reut Kidron, who is with us here today, uh, who have made this day special uh, with us. So enjoy the day, everyone. And please join us afterwards online on our social media and on our websites, and you will see uh, the recording of this uh, session. Thank you, Zara. Thank you for your opening words. Uh, without further ado, uh, I will move to our guest lecturer for today. Today, we are joined by Professor Marguerite Ziv, uh, PTO Diagic, Director of Game for the Future and Senior Lecturer and Academic Consultant of the Early Childhood MA program at uh, Kaye Academic College of Education in Beersheba, Israel. Uh, please, Professor Ziv, take it from here. Okay, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, good night, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I can't even express it in words. I'm so thankful for to Mashav who invited us. I regard this uh, meeting as inviting us, meaning Games for the Future, as uh, Sarah mentioned before, Reut Kidron, the CEO of uh, Games for the Future, who actually founded with a group of friends, 
the NGO that is advancing the project I will tell you about. I also saw that our one of our uh, senior staff uh, leading ladies, Tamar Berti is here with us. So I'm very, very uh, happy about that. And again, I'm really pleased to have been invited and I'm, I wish I could say that I'm pleased to see you all. But now that the presentation is shared, I can only see some of you. Hopefully one day we will be able to meet uh, face to face and to actually see and meet each other. I'm very happy that this topic was chosen, strengthening cultural identity and promoting empathy in early childhood. As you just said, we will focus on the persona doll approach. And I'm extremely pleased to see that so many people, almost 100 till now, have joined this session, uh, showing that we are a big community who is really interested in early childhood, who is interesting in strengthening these important capacities in children. And I'm pleased about this afternoon and this opportunity. So I think we're here, all of us together, because we really address a global challenge, a big global, global challenge that's been recognized for, for years, but still is a huge challenge that we have to deal with. The issue is really implementing children's rights, enabling children to, to have lives that actually uh, fulfill the rights. Recently, UN has published a, rever a, a recent uh, version of children's rights a name sustainable development goals. And the issue which we will discuss today falls in the bigger framework of children's rights and sustainable development. Early childhood and uh, early childhood ed education and development has actually grown, gone through a significant and hopeful change, I should say, over the years. For many years, the most important goals used to be taking care of children's survival, which is extremely important, of course, and a necessary condition for everything else, whether it's hygiene, health, nutrition, everything that has to do with basic needs. And then on top of that, there was a recognition that in order to be successful, successful in one's own community and in the global society, it's very important to, write, to provide children with basic cognitive skills, focusing mainly on literacy and math. Nowadays, the approach to early childhood education and development has widened, has widened all over the world. Educationals and, the, and, and researchers come to recognize that as important as the survival and cognitive skills for children's well being is their social emotional learning, is their strong and positive cultural identity, is enhancing within children positive attitudes toward the cultural diversity that is, is existent in their society and country. We, we realize more and more that it's important to address family and community values. About 40, I would say, years ago, the main approach was the child in the center. Not so much was it was a, no, not so much people talked about the relationships with the relationships of the child with the adults around him, and especially not with the community he lives in. We now know how important it is to anchor children's education and development within the community values. And we also talk, and the UN talks about it now, and it's a very important, I think, addition or emphasis to the original Children's Rights Convention. We talk about raising children to become partners in a fair, coherent, and peaceful society. I think it's very, very natural to anchor this approach, this wide, broad, deep approach of early childhood education and development in the well-known theoretical framework of Born von Brunner, naming, namely the ecological theory. I'm sure we all know this theory, but I would like to emphasize a few things in relation to the shift that is happening now in early childhood education. In the center, in the red is still the child. The child is really the target of our educational work. The two most important or most immediate circles that impact child's education and development are family and the early year setting. We probably, most of us are both parents of children and uh, professionals in early years settings. Some of us probably are also community workers and today as I said before the circle of the wider community reserves more and more attention 
as does the even wider circle of the country, the media, the culture, the research that goes on, and so on. Recently, the International Network of Peace Building, which, whose logo is at the, at the bottom of the slide, and I, which I belonged to for many years, has added a new circle. This circle has to define whether children grow up in a region of conflict, of violent conflict. Again, recognizing more and more that grow, growing up in a region that is impacted by ongoing armed conflict strongly impacts and affects children's, uh, children's development and should be recognizing in the processes of educating children. So as you can see partially in the widest uh, circle, there is a definition of the different stages a conflict can be in and that children are exposed to. They can be at a pre, the country can be in the pre-conflict uh, stage, it can be in the peak of the conflict, it, it can be in the post-conflict uh, process, it can be in the peace building, uh, building stage, and this affects children uh, in addition to the other circles that have been mentioned by Bond from Brenner. So if we understand, and we came to this session with this understanding, how important early childhood is for children's development generally and specifically for the issues and topics we're going to discuss today. An interesting question rises regarding this very inspirational person whom we all know, Nelson Mandela. We all know that Nelson Mandela was a very hopeful and optimistic person, despite the fact that he grew up and lived in a society that was strongly divided, strongly racist. He suffered during most of his life from oppression, from racism, from hate. He was in prison for 26 years. And then the minute he came out of prison, he was the one who led the reconciliation process in South Africa and came up with, a, with an amazing hopeful quotes about children's uh, education. He has many inspiring quotes. Uh, one of them, one of the most famous one is the one that appears here in the middle. No one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite. But again, the question is, how did Nelson Mandela of all people that did not experience love, did not experience equality, did not experience the society valuing his culture, how did he develop such an humanistic uh, approach and worldview? Apparently in his autobiography, uh, Nelson Mandela actually explains how this happened. And what he says is that what's responsible for this very amazing inspirational approach is his early childhood years, his early childhood experiences. He grew up in a remote little village in the Transkei region in South Africa. He was raised by a very a warm and smart mother and father, but he mentions his mother as a very significant adult in his life. Within the village, within the family, he was taught to value a humanistic values like equality, like respect of others, like collaboration, like solidarity. The whole village, the whole community in the village actually lived according to, to these norms and these values. His family was a very respect, respected family in the village. And he says that throughout his life, throughout the very, very difficult years and experiences he had, he carried within him the early experiences and the early values he was taught and experienced during his early childhood years. So I think this really persuades us if we needed any more persuasion of how important it is to educate children to have the right values, the right social experiences, to develop empathy, and of course their own cultural identity. So the first step in being able to actually implement uh, sorry. Uh, so the question is, the question is, so how do we do it? How do we do it? How do we actually uh, accomplish the goals I mentioned before, or the topics I mentioned before here? How do we actually teach social emotional skills, develop cultural identity, and so on? How do we do that? It's a big challenge. It's a very big challenge. It's much easier, much easier to teach children literacy and math. Almost all over the world now, educators know how to teach children their letters. 
the letters are a closed entity. In Hebrew, there are 22 letters. In Arabic, there are 29 letters. Each language, maybe except for the Chinese and Japanese, who take a, need a lifelong journey to teach their letters and words, in most languages and most cultures, teaching letters and teaching basic reading skills is not that difficult, and we have the knowledge. We have the know-how in most countries of the world, the same about math. Whatever the numbers a child has to learn are, he can learn them. They're basically 10, 10 digits. It's, it's not a big deal to learn these eight, 10 digits. Basic math computations, basic math computations that allow much more involvement and success, success in societies that in the past are relatively easy to teach. They are systematic, they are decontextualized in the, in the manner that we use similar techniques to teach reading and math in many countries. It's much more difficult to teach the contextualized skills, social emotional learning, cultural identity, which is strongly tied in the unique conditions each child grows in, and empathy skills that again, are not structured and not systematic, that's a much bigger challenge. The first step, the first step I would say in thinking about how to teach children or how to educate children according to the values and according to the capacities we actually want them to have in order to improve their well being and integration in the society is really knowing, learning about the development of attitudes towards in groups and out groups during early childhood. I don't know how it is in other countries, if a, a student teachers are taught in the courses that they learn during their training, the development of a social attitudes in Israel, many, many, many courses are devoted to development. Very few, if at all, teach, teach teachers the developmental course of children's ethnic and out attitudes towards in groups and out groups. So very, very briefly, I will go here through three important stages. Of course, there's, if we want to go deep, more deeply into it, there's a lot more to read about them, but it's important at least to understand the basic stages. So first, first of all, as babies or as very, very young toddlers, children come to appreciate or differentiate between people who differ in skill, color, and language, meaning they appreciate what they perceive. They can see skin color, they can hear the language, they get to know their own, uh, their own characteristics as well as differentiate between the, themselves and people who belong to different cultures. Of course, that is if they encounter people from different cultures. Nelson Mandela at the time didn't even know that he's growing up in a racist uh, country where the dominant group is white. He just grew up in a black a society he didn't even know why he didn't even uh, wasn't even exposed to different skin colors and languages but many children in the world are and in a very very young age they come to differentiate these uh, characteristics gradually children become aware of deeper characteristics like gender like social status like ethnicity and again gradually they come to realize or learn about deeper experiences that characterize different social and cultural groups. Then an interesting thing happens, a very interesting thing happens. Children from dominant, from dominant groups who feel good about their own identity, who feel strong in the society, develop a clear bias towards their in-group. They show clear preference towards playing with children from their in-group. So a white child in the United States, of course, will choose still today to play or more, there's a higher, a higher chance that they will choose to play with another white child rather than a, with an African-American child. The Israeli dominant group children will probably use, uh, will, 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 will select to sit next to, in their, in their preschool next to um, in a secular kid like them rather than an Arab child or an Ethiopian girl. What happens in minority groups or in non-dominant groups? Interesting, what happens in these groups is that they do not grow up with a, such a strong positive sense of their own cultural identity. So what happens to them is that they have an opposite bias. They show bias towards the dominant group. 
So there are very interesting exper experiments that show in various countries in the world, the children who belong to minority groups, when they are asked who they want to play with, who they want to share their toys or their sweets with, who they want to sit next to, who are nice children and who are bad children, they will always associate the positive, uh, the positive characteristics to the dominant group. They will also prefer to be like them, prefer to play with them. So both groups, in a sense, have this intergroup, this uh, anti-bias towards groups within the society where dominant children have a bias against uh, minority groups and children from minority groups also have a bias against minority groups, which is very sad, which is very sad and makes what we, what we are trying to do so very, very important. So in this, section, in this session, we will present an approach to tackle this issue and to uh, fulfill oh, the problem. Last one. Is there any problems? So as I said, in this uh, session, we will approach, we will present the persona dolls approach. And let's start with a quick glimpse at persona dolls from all over the world. As you can see, two very uh, um, salient characteristic of persona dolls is first that they reflect cultural diversity. It's obvious. And the second characteristic, which you can also see quite easily, I think, in these pictures, is that they resemble real children. Their physical appearance resembles re real children. I have no with me today. Let's see if you can see. No, I have no with me today, who is an Arab Muslim child from Israel and is very excited to be with you today. She says she would very much like you at the uh, very soon to get to know her a little bit better. But I told her at the beginning that she needs patience and that I will talk first and then she will have a chance to introduce herself. So the, the dolls resemble real children in their physical appearance, but not only in their physical appearance. When they are brought to the preschool by the teacher, and we will describe shortly how this is done, they actually behave like children in the class. They are not dolls that children play with. They are not dolls that you put in the social dramatic corner and allow children to put them to bed and to check them as if they were doctors and if they were, as if they were dolls. They're not like that. They actually join the children in all the classroom, all the classroom activities. And what they do is that they share and discuss their stories, their life experiences, their likes, their dislikes, their dislikes, their culture, their challenges. They are really buddies. They become really buddies of the children in the classroom. And just a few, a few examples, you can see them sitting on the right-hand slide, just on the sofa, waiting for the teacher to come and tell them a story. On the left top, in the picture, you can see that they actually learn, actually learn with the children, whether it's their letters, whether they read books, they are, uh, they learn what they, with the children, what they, according to the curricula. The bottom three pictures are from Israel. The bottom left, I think it's the same direction. The bottom left, in the bottom left, you can see Gil. Gil is also here with me. Gil's favorite holiday is the Mimuna. Mimuna, his family celebrates the Mimuna. And he's very happy that he was invited in the classroom just when he wants to tell me something. He says to me that I mustn't forget to mention the very special clothes he's wearing. He also said that he brought his, his brother's very special clothes in blue. His, brother's unfortunately, his brother unfortunately couldn't come with him to the class, but he brought at least the beautiful uh, clothes he wears during the Mimuna. And, and he also brought the special foods that they eat and he loves. And <laughs> he tells me that when he comes to the classroom, he deliberately covers the third uh, dish and asks the kids to guess what he brought. And he says, sometimes they guess, sometimes they don't. On another opportunity, Gil, as you see in the middle, was invited to one of the preschool classrooms and the children discovered and were very worried about the fact that they didn't have a mask. And they were really worried and anxious about that. But of course, immediately, one of the kids said that he has another extra mask in his, uh, in his lunchbox and gave it to, to Gil. On the right hand picture, we can see Shachar. 
this amazing Ethiopian child who lives in Israel and talks both Hebrew and Amharic. And she is teaching now. She wants me to tell you that she chose the words she wanted to teach the children. So the words she chose, as you can see, are a, a clock, a basketball, ice cream. She loves ice cream. She wants to tell you that in addition to the punch banana ice cream here, she also loves chocolate ice cream, which doesn't appear in the picture. So she uh, uh, taught the kids words in Amharic and they added them to their vocabulary uh, in Hebrew. So as you can see, the adults in many ways actually join the children in their activities. They want to present or introduce the dolls to the, to the children are actually the teachers. The teachers who, want, who tell the persona dolls stories. The dolls do not talk like dolls. Gil doesn't come and say, I'm Gil, I'm very pleased to meet you. The teachers are not, not actresses, not actors. Gil is a child. The teacher is a teacher. Gil is a little bit shy because he's not used to seeing so many people on one screen. So he asks if I would be willing to tell you his stories while he whispers them in my ear. And of course, I'm willing to do that. So this is what the teachers always do. The persona doll whispers to the, into the teacher's ear and the teacher then facilitates children's encounters, discussions and activities with the persona doll. So I think these first three, these first three slides about the persona dolls give you a little bit of the feeling of how powerful they can be and how strong the potential of using there it can be in accomplishing the goals we're all interested in. But being inspired by the dolls or kind of having the impression that they can be uh, efficient in uh, educating children according to the values we're interested in is not enough. So in the, I would say in the last 20 or 30 years, there's quite a lot of research that is done to, to actually investigate whether the persona doll approach is uh, efficient or not, whether it's suitable for children, whether it can actually make changes in children's approaches, values, behaviors, capacities. I will only uh, describe two of the many uh, studies. I chose to uh, describe uh, both very recent studies and, and studies that are very different from each other and reflect both the, the, the main topics we're interested in today. So the, the first article that was published that I'm presenting today is from Greece, and it tells the story or the research and study of using persona dolls to empower refugee children, to empower refugee children. As you can see on the right hand side, the persona doll that was developed for this project was Saeed. Saeed is a refugee himself from Syria. And in this study, the persona doll was actually used to enhance children's sense of their own cultural identity. After the, leaving their country, Syria, and arriving in Greece and feeling outsiders, strangers, confused, they needed an opportunity or means to help them address the very difficult issues they have to tackle, specifically the identity issues. So the persona doll, the, the research question was, the main research question was, how can the persona doll influence identity, attitudes, and learning of Arabic-speaking refugee children in Greece? The study was a qualitative study. The persona doll mirrored the children's specific, specific characteristics and experiences and their cultural identity and shared stories that reflected the doll's experiences, which were very, very similar and resonated with the children's personal experiences and the results, and I'm really talking about it very, deep, very briefly, it is a wonderful and highly recommended article. The results, the results showed that the use of persona doll actually generated positive attitudes and empathy, empowered by bicultural identity and contributed to language education. On the right-hand bottom slide, you can see this girl who is actually helping Saeed. She actually, knows Greek pretty well. In brackets, the teachers wrote that she's not that strong in Greek, but she's willing to teach Saeed, who is really struggling with his uh, Greek language. And by teaching him, of course, she feels empowered. She suddenly is much more willing 
to learn the Greek language herself and feels much better about the experience she is dealing with. The other study which I will present was the study conducted in Israel. I was one of the three researchers who conducted the study. We conducted a quantitative research. Our research question was, how will an intervention based on persona dolls affect Israeli children's out-group attitudes? So the previous study we, I described was about in-group attitudes, about children's own cultural identity, about children's own positive self-esteem. Here we're talking about an intervention that was aimed mainly at affecting children's out-group attitudes. 110 kindergarten Israeli children participated in a six-week intervention study, pretty uh, intensive, and they met during the course of the intervention with these four persona dolls who are here at the bottom, a secular Israeli boy named Tom, Ethiopian girl, Shaha, whom you've just met, the Arab Muslim girl, No, who you've just met, and the Israeli religious child, Noam, who was the fourth, fourth a persona doll. And we checked their attitudes towards these uh, different uh, children from different cultures before and after the intervention study and found a significant increase in children's attitudes towards Shahar, whom you can see it was represented by a photograph at the end of the study, uh, at the top, uh, the top photograph, um, Shams, an Arab girl, and a, a religious child. And we found that the children's attitudes uh, improved. They were more willing to sit near to uh, children from out groups who, were they, who, were they, who towards whom they were resentful before. And they were also willing to, pl to play more with these out group children. So we have these studies that together, that together show and actually they describe the power, I would say, of the persona dolls for promoting equity and empathy. So the dolls make the different backgrounds of the children visible to others in the group. The dolls provide opportunities for children to see their own individuality and culture value. They build the child's self-esteem. They introduce children to social diversity which which they have little or no experience or knowledge. They enable all children to gain an awareness and understanding of the richness and diversity of different lifestyles. They help children develop non-discriminatory attitudes and understandings within the children themselves. They encourage children to value each other equally and with empathy. And they enhance children's strategies for dealing, dealing with unfairness against themselves and others. Hmm. Why is it not uh, just a in a nutshell, in a nutshell, just summarizing, I would say, summarizing a, a very broad a perspective I showed in these different boxes in the previous talk, we can say that the persona dolls promote self-esteem and pride in one's own identity and culture. They enhance children's empathy towards their own culture and others, and they strengthen within children and anti-bias attitudes and capacities. So this is the potential of the persona dolls. Let's, let's become practice. Let's, let's, let's be practical now. And let's see if one wants to actually implement the persona doll approach in their community, how can it actually be done? So here I have kind of a flow chart of the main stages of a, a characterizing your project and planning it and implementing it. There are 10 stages here. I will just read them aloud now, and then we will go gradually stage by stage to understand better the principles that underlie each stage and how to actually do it. So the first stage is to characterize your context. As we said, this is a very contextual, contextualized mission that we're going into. So the first stage is characterizing your context, your context. The second stage is defining your goals. The third stage is to select, to select dolls that reflect your context and your goals. And then you create authentic personas and identities, design your persona dolls, develop guidance and curricular activities, invest in capacity building, document what you do, that's very important, reflect and improve. I know it sounds kind of a big, 
a task, but I, as I said, I will simplify it now. I will simplify because I think one of the purposes is really for each uh, and every one of us have the capacity to uh, go out of this uh, uh, session and start, start the first stage of implementing a, a similar approach, of course, if you're interested in doing so. So as I said, the first step is to characterize your social a cultural context. I will bring an example from Israel because I cannot bring, I cannot characterize the context of any other a culture. I can only do it regarding the Israeli society. So in Israel, we have a multicultural society. We unfortunately experience very strong tensions, little tolerance and racism amongst the different cultures that, it, that, they, that are part of the Israeli social puzzle. We have, again, unfortunately, have to address the ongoing violent conflict between Israel and its neighboring Arab countries, an ongoing a, a conflict for about 100 years. And we have separate educational systems for the different social and cultural groups in Israel. So if you look at the top picture in which you see three Israelis a riding on a bus together or on a train together. You can see on the right-hand side an Israeli and Arab Muslim woman. In the middle, you can see an Israeli soldier. And on the left, you can see an ultra-Orthodox Israeli. You can see that they are very, very different. I think you can also tense that they're not that happy to sit next to each other. They both, let's say that they are not using this opportunity to communicate with each other, to get familiar with each other, other, to make their ride a little bit more fun. And it's not to say that Israelis are very quiet or uh, reserved. Israelis know how to speak and how to uh, get to know people who they're interested in. So most, probably most likely, the Arab woman in the train was raised in an Arab preschooler, which is represented at the a bottom right picture. The Israeli secular soldier was most likely educated in a secular preschool. And the religious person, or not actually this exact religious person, somebody that's not as extreme, was raised in a, a religious, a, in a religious preschool. As I mentioned before, these are three separate uh, educational systems that exist within the Israeli society. So children from the different social groups in Israel actually have very, very little opportunities to meet each other, to spend time with each other on a daily basis and to get to know each other's uh, culture. So this is the first stage, characterize your own social and cultural context. Then of course, define your goals. The first stage in defining your goals is really identifying the relevant issues you would like to focus on. There are many, many, many issues that can be addressed by using persona dolls all over the world. And countries in different countries, cultures in different countries actually focus on very, very different um, issues that are rele relevant to their own society. We, out of these uh, 11 possibilities of values or relevant issues, use the middle four used to, we, we just decided to address cultural issues, ethnicity issues. As, as I said, we have a strong uh, Israeli Arab conflict, uh, racism and the violent, the violent conflict. We didn't address in our uh, initial uh, project, for example, the HIV and AIDS uh, issues. We didn't tackle the refugees uh, uh, issue. Other countries, of course, can define their own goals. And again, it's contextualized and com completely culture uh, specific. Hmm. OK. Yes. There are always these uh, some technical problems. So after identifying or selecting the issues we would like, we decided to focus on, we defined our goals. So we wanted to, fam to familiarize children with Israeli diversity. We can see on the right hand side how the diverse the Israeli society is to enhance positive attitudes towards self and others' identity and culture, to enhance, enhance children's awareness and empathy towards children who experience unfairness and racism, <clears throat> to strengthen children's social engagement and activism, and to create the, create the foundation for a more coherent 
and just society. It may be that in many countries, the goals that are identified, they can be pretty similar to these, but still uh, customized to the specific culture. The third stage is to select, and I combine the design as well, the persona dolls that reflect the context and goals. So in Israel, we develop, I was, I'm saying we, but I have to give the credit to the Games for the Future NGO who led this process. We developed seven persona dolls representing, uh, not fully representing, we can never really present every little group within the uh, society directly by the dolls, but we developed seven persona dolls who represent different uh, or the main cultures in Israel. And if I go from left to right, the <coughs> Shachar from the Ethiopian community next to her is sitting Naomi from the ultra-Orthodox uh, community, Noam, national religious, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's less meaningful for people from the, uh, other countries to get acquainted with the Israeli dolls because it's really a mission of each country <coughs> to select dolls that are relevant to that culture. I'm sorry. <coughs> the first, the fourth step is to create authentic personas and identities. So I, gave, I brought you an example of Nu. Let me remind you who Nu is and allow her now to participate in our session. This is Nu. No one loves to tell about her culture, loves to tell about her culture. And this is part of her story. I, of course, I of course won't read it all, but the points on the left-hand side, side are very important. The process of developing the personas and identities so that they will be authentic, a, authentic and non-stereotypical, very important, non-stereotypical persona has a few guiding principles. First of all, it has to be a participatory process. I, as a secular Jewish uh, woman, cannot develop the persona of Nu. In order to, ve to develop an authentic persona of an Arab girl, she has to be uh, planned by a group of Arabs who belong to the community, who join the same culture, the habits, the lifestyle, the worldviews, so in order to capture, to capture these authentic um, perceptions, we had focus groups that were led by uh, leading professionals and social activists from uh, social and academic organizations that represented each one of the persona dolls that we uh, created the personas for. So there were in these focus groups, there were representatives of the community, there were also multidisciplinary professionals, and they also worked according to shared international guidelines, which allow similarity in uh, the, the different dolls' personas and create a very, very equal presentation of the different dolls. So we don't, for example, emphasize um, like the one doll's uh, uh, amazing uh, parents who work in these amazing jobs and don't mention the parents uh, for other dolls. In fact, in our project, we decided not to mention the parents professionals at all because it was a complex issue for us. So we gave up a, a mentioning the parents professionals altogether in all the identities and personas. And finally, the focus groups came up with this very rich, interesting background story, which is the base for the different stories the teachers then tell uh, the children when they invite no to the to the preschool. And as you can see, if you when you get the actual presentation late, later on, the four different colors actually represent the different circles in Braun von Berner's a, a, a model. So Braun von Berner's model is not just an inspirational theoretical model, it actually guides us in preparing the doll stories. So first of all, no a new story tells about her, some of her personal uh, life facts, I would say. She's five, years, she's five years old. She lives in a little valid village with her mother and father. And she brings along with her a picture of her village. Her, her mother and grandmother and grandfather live nearby and so do her cousins, which is very customary of a lot of uh, Arab families in Israel. Then we go on to the wider circle, her family, 
her culture, she speaks Arabic, she loves listening to stories in Arabic that her teacher Fadwa reads to the children at school. So the names, the names are the names that are common in the uh, Arab society, but she also likes things that children, that, you, that are universal for children. She likes reading, reading books. Her favorite book is Elephants Are Not Allowed In, which by the way, appears, is, was originally written in, in English, was then translated to Hebrew, and then translated to Arabic, and really presents a very multicultural, accepting, respectful uh, society, and it's really a beautiful book. And, uh, Shah, and uh, Noor really loves this book. She also feels that she's presented authentically in this book because the society the, that is presented in this book is very, very, very diverse. And she likes, uh, she likes it when the books uh, give her the opportunity to feel she's, she's a, a part of the, of the community. She then, she then uh, her story then tells her about the uh, communities, the community habits. For example, uh, she doesn't go to school on Fridays. She sometimes go with, goes with her father to the mosque on Friday. And her mother sometimes and often travels to new countries and knows the wish and dream, like a regular, like a universal child, is to travel to beautiful new countries uh, uh, with her mother. And her mother promised her that as she, when she gets a little bit older, she will actually uh, take her with her. The sixth a step is to develop guidance and curricular materials, which is a very, very, very important uh, step. Uh, the main uh, um, pedagogical activities or curricular materials are stories that accompany that are accompanying with ideas for preschool and family discussions and activities. I must say that Tamar is here with us. She is our expert in writing beautiful stories about in each and every one of the dolls. I don't have unfortunately time to actually read to you uh, the stories because I prefer to uh, share with you the principles of the different stories. The stories are all short stories that tell about the dolls, the persona dolls, the childs, the friends, experiences. By this time when the, uh, when the persona dolls, when Noah starts to tell her stories, the children don't relate to her as a doll anymore. They relate to her as a child. And as you will see when I present these different, uh, uh, these different stages of uh, developing and telling stories to the children, you will see the gradual process that uh, the stories uh, reflect. So at the beginning, we introduce the, Noor no introduces herself to the children. She tells them about her age, her family, her, hobby, her hobbies. She says that she loves playing with her cousins after school because they live very, very close by to her. And they all go together to eat uh, dinners at her grandmother, grandmother's house. She also tells them, tells them about very basic uh, cultural, uh, cultural information, like the language she speaks in, the location where she lives in. So she doesn't live in a big, a big city. She lives in a little village. She may tell them that in their little garden, they grow some uh, uh, vegetables or spices. Very kind of a brief introduction. Gradually, gradually, we go into deeper uh, acquaintance with the dog and we get to know, the children get to know the new friend better. So Noor can tell them about a story, a story about an experience she had at the first stage, we prefer that she tells an experience that is close to children's own experiences, just to create this closeness and this identification and the first seeds of empathy towards the persona dog. But then we move on to deeper, uh, to deeper uh, issues and, in, and no tells us stories that help her children better understand her life and experiences, including both negative and negative. She can present, for example, an anti-bias issue. She can tell them a story, and Noor uh, told us this story in one of the sessions. Yeah, I know, I know what story you mean. She went to buy ice cream one day with her father, and she really looked forward to it. Every Monday, she, she, used to, she goes with her father to this ice cream parlor, and she really looks forward to eating her favorite chocolate ice cream. When they arrived at the ice cream parlor, there was another little cute girl there and it looked 
more or less her age, looked very cute to her. And uh, Nur said to her father in Arabic what ice cream she wanted him to buy. But the minute the other girl heard her asking for the ice cream in Arabic, she said to her father, I don't want to buy ice cream here anymore. I don't want to buy ice cream where an Arab child buys ice cream. And Noor tell the children the story. Yes, and she asks them whether they can help her in solving the problem. Yes, and now she says that she really likes ice cream and she wants to go back to the ice cream parlor, but she doesn't want to meet again children who do not want to be with her. And she asks for the help of the children. And the children, very interesting, have lots and lots of ideas uh, and, and suggest them to her. For example, they can suggest that uh, she talks back to the child and explains to her that she talks Arabic, but she still, she still likes ice cream like her. They suggest very, very interesting uh, suggestions. And at a further stage, person adults can meet each other. So for example, no, an Arab Muslim girl apparently discovers that both she and Shachar love theater. And they met each other in a theater afternoon activity and they became friends. And since then, they visit each other in their homes and they have so much fun in getting to know each other's home, families, and to discover how there are some things that they actually both like and enjoy uh, doing together. So. The, se the seventh very, very important step is capacity building. As you can see in the picture here, the capacity building itself, the one I am uh, happily involved in, in my college at Be'er Sheva in the south of Israel, uh, includes uh, students, students who are teachers themselves and our, our experienced teachers and reflect themselves in the classroom, some of the diversity in Israel. So they work in groups, develop the curricular materials, think of ideas for conversations they can have with the children, help each other and learn about the different cultures. And as you can see here, this little group of four women includes an Arab Muslim student, Nasrin, a, with, a, with her back to us, is a, a secular Jewish a, a teacher. Her name is Tali Shulamit, a, a religious, a, a religious uh, teacher and next to her, another religious uh, teacher. For many, this is the first opportunity to have in-depth discussions with women or with professionals who share with them the educational challenge of Israel, but never had a chance to discuss them in, a, in an egalitarian uh, atmosphere. And they, the, the messages that are important to uh, instill within the teachers are that the core of the experience of the children with the persona dolls is the, conversa is, is the conversations they have with them. So the teachers really uh, have to learn and, and it comes very naturally to them to bring the persona doll to life, to keep the session short, informative and enjoyable, ensure that the persona doll shares her feelings and, invite, and invites children to express theirs and engage the children. The teacher, as I said, the teachers is not an actress. She is a teacher who facilitates the discussion between Noor, who tells her story, and the children. She is the facilitator and she helps children engage and she asks leading open-ended questions that create empathy. Document. Document is so important. Some teachers find it difficult initially to document, but pretty quickly they come to understand that the, that the core and the essence of the program is, uh, is presented in their documentations, the documentations of what actually happens at, in the class with the persona dolls. So I'll give you just three brief examples that present each different aspects and different impacts that the persona dolls can have. So for example, Shachal becomes friends with a lonely child. So this teacher shared, and I'm giving you very, very, very recent experiences that my students shared with me. This, for example, is from last week. So this teacher named Irit uh, told us that Shachar, Shachar, whom we all really, really love, and so do most of the children, Shachar arrived at school 
a few children didn't respond that positively at the beginning. They said that she was only a doll and not only a girl and that she was ugly. The major shift, I'm shortening of course the story, but then the major shift happened thanks to this girl, girl whose name was Dora. She insisted that Shahal accompanies her in everything she does, during meal time, story time, playing with blocks, outdoor play, all the time, wherever she went, she wanted a Shahar to join her. She played with her. She talked to her. She was really, she really became buddies. When all the other teachers, children saw that, now they all wanted to be friends with Shahar. They all wanted to sit next to her to share to, when she shares her stories. They began fights in the classroom about who sits next to Shahar today. Then the teacher reflects and says, I asked myself, why was Doha so attached to Shahar? And then it was obvious. Doa had no friends. She was often alone and lonely. She identified with Shaha and they became buddies. Then Doa's mother called me, the teacher says, and said that Doa is so much happier now that she has a new friend in the classroom. So this is an example that basically is not even cultural. It's not even culture. Shaha helped Doa raise her a social, um, status, I would say, and experiences in the classroom, except that she did identify with her following the children who resented her. So she felt, she felt that both of them were, so to speak, underdogs for very different reasons. And that's what, that's what brought them closely together. And that's, that's what opened uh, for Shaha the opportunity to share with the children, yes, lots and lots of her cultural experience and identity issues. Another, another example, which is again very, very recent, actually Tamar, Tamar was again here with us, shared this uh, story with us. This is Alice, a teacher who allowed us to share her picture and story. She told us about Gil, whom you've met before, who shared with the children his experience during COVID, COVID lockdown. The children, and she writes, she tells us the story, the teacher, the children yesterday came back from one week lockdown and they were, she really felt that they were stressed and unquiet and anxious. And she really knew that the right thing to do was not to go on with teaching math and literacy, but to enable the children to talk about their experiences. And then a good way she thought for doing this was to have Gil share with them how difficult the lockdown was for him. And that opened the children up and they shared with Gil their own experiences. And then Gil used, the, Gil used the opportunity to also insert into the discussions the cultural issues. So Gil also told them that during the lockdown, he listened to the music that his family liked. And of course, he brought an example to the class of some of the music they listened to during lockdown, Moroccan music. And that he looked at the family picture album with his father, who told him about his child in Morocco. So as you can see, that there's a good natural integration between sharing and being and feeling empathy towards a shared experience of all the children and through that closeness, allow uh, the different persona dolls to share with the children their cultural stories. And the last example for today, no, no challenges the preschool staff. I think this is a fascinating uh, example that uh, this teacher, Hani, who is a student of mine and again, allowed us, gave us the permission to share both the story and the picture. Uh, so Noor challenges the preschool staff. Noor arrived in our class at a very tense time. She, the, the classroom, the, the preschool is located in a very tense uh, city in Israel in which uh, Arabs and Jews live close to each other, but often experience very, very tense uh, conflicts in the city. And no told, no led actually to very difficult conversations within the staff. The teacher tells us, I'm a Sephardic secular Jew. The teacher aide is a Muslim Arab. The complimentary teacher is a Jewish Ethiopian. And the special education teacher is Jewish religious. It almost uh, it sounds like an invented story, fiction story, but it isn't. This is the reality of this of the preschool. And then she goes on the teachers and shares with us that for the first time in 10 years, the Arab teacher aide 
participated, participates and is suddenly dominant in planning and conducting the children's meeting and conversations with no, because who else can present the Arab culture better than the teacher aide herself. By the way, the teacher aide wasn't interested in her photograph uh, uh, shared with others. So I can only show the uh, main teacher's uh, picture, but the teacher aide was actually the one who, as I said, conducted most of the activities with Nu. She read to the children a story in Arabic and the teacher read the same story to the children uh, in Hebrew. She taught the children to write their names in Arabic. They taught the, she taught the children a song in Arabic. They taught, she told the children about Arabic holidays. So it all seemed to be so good, so good. But then the other teachers did not like what happened. Did not like what happened. They felt that it wasn't appropriate for them that in this Jewish preschool, who actually um, was conducted only according to the Jewish dominant curriculum uh, suddenly gives room, gives space for the Arab teacher aid. They, they, they really were resentment and there was a lot of tension within the staff. That's when the teacher, Khani, the leading teachers felt it's too big for, it's too big for her to deal with it herself. And she requested sessions with a psychologist in order to help all of the team. She says it in her own words that will help us learn to respect each other and work better together. So the dolls, I think what this documentation reveals to us is that persona dolls can do many things in, mayor, in many layers uh, in, the, in the preschool. They first can really um, present new cultures to children in a very authentic manner, in a very enjoyable manner, in a way that really bridges gaps of many, many years, but they're also an opportunity for not so easy conversations. I cannot even tell you that this has a happy ending because I don't know. This is, as I said, a story that, they, that Hani shared with me last week. They haven't even started the sessions with us as a psychologist. I believe that only good things can happen from an event like this. Opening up the tensions and talking about them, I think will only bring uh, good things to the, uh, to the staff, but I can't uh, share with you the facts for, for sure. I'm hopeful. So the next stage, we're almost at the end. I hope you see by now that it's very enjoyable, challenging, but doable is to reflect. And I would like to share with you some, only some of the points that we share when we reflect about the, the process. First of all, the children, of course. We find, that we find that children are extremely curious. Although at the, when we tested them in the research I described before, they did have, they did have biased uh, attitudes towards our groups, but at the same time, they're flexible and they're extremely curious. The children in the preschool I've just described where the teacher A suddenly he became visible and told the children about her culture, didn't stop asking her questions, didn't stop asking her questions. Isn't she hot when she wears this uh, traditional, traditional dress? What language do they speak? Can she teach them more and more and more and more words in Arabic? Can she teach them another song in Arabic? They kept begging her to tell them more and more and more about the, the culture. After 10 years, where she didn't, they hardly, they didn't know anything about her, even though they saw her, they saw how different physically she was in her traditional dressing, but never, never felt close enough, never had the opportunity to actually uh, get involved in uh, getting to know her better. The children closely relate to the persona dolls. They really, some teachers are a, a, a little, if so a little bit of fear at the beginning, thinking that the children will identify that these are dolls and real children, would actually have, which actually happens. But once the children, uh, the teacher says that the children are right, no, is actually a doll. Yes, she's a doll. But you will tell us stories as if she's a, a real girl that, completely calms the children and they then relate to her as a, as a child. They develop pride in their own cultural identity. This is a very, very important point of reflection that we have come to realize. Children who belong to minority groups within the Israeli educational system really feel empowered. For example, when Tom, the Russian boy, suddenly for the first time shares with them 
the Novigod holiday that he celebrates. I assume that some of the people here uh, today in today's session know very well what, no, what Novigod is, but it's not a Jewish or an Israeli holiday. And suddenly Tom, who has experienced two or three difficult years uh, in preschool, suddenly for the first time celebrates with the children the, the holiday he loves so much. So they, it really helps develop pride uh, in children's own identity. They express empathy based on their closeness to the doll. They express empathy towards her. They are great problem solvers. When the persona dolls share with them the issues, the difficult issues that they, attack, that they have to address as minority groups or as unprivileged groups, they are very good problem solvers. And all children are empowered, whether culturally or as we saw in one of the examples, emotionally in, in the classroom. Reflecting now about the teachers. And again, every slide can be a whole session in itself. The teachers, as I said before, use the persona dolls often, first of all, to present their own culture, their own identity, their own experiences. For many of them, it is like a healing experience, a healing opportunity. They too did not bring their culture into the preschool. They left their culture, their identity out of the classroom. And they, <coughs> they did whatever they could to, I would say, to meet the shared dominant uh, messages um, that they thought was required of them. And suddenly they discover that there's room, that there's room for them to bring themselves into, into their professional lives, into their uh, meetings with children. It's much easier in a sense than they, than they had thought. The teachers are also willing, and that's also very exciting and moving uh, when it happens. The teachers are, in, are, are willing to address the challenges that certain persona dolls create and strengthen their own empathy towards those cultural groups which they had difficulties or had difficulties with uh, for many years. The teachers are creative, the teachers are flexible, but yet at the same time, they need guidance, they enjoy guidance, they enjoy uh, being able to use pre-prepared curricular materials. And very importantly, they also need emo emotional support because it is a challenging process. It's a new experience. It's a, a, it's a, a challenging experience and they can enjoy emotional support as well. The different cultures within the staff become salient and are usually, but not always, as you could see, celebrated. The teachers themselves experience meaningful personal, professional, and identity-related re challenges. And lastly, but not less important, the parents. Most of the parents are supportive. Some can initially raise questions and doubts. What helps them is, what makes them become positive is when they, when they experience that their culture is presented and that their child is empowered. So whether it's Shachau from the Ethiopian community who suddenly is a, who suddenly celebrates with the children her favorite holiday, the Sigd, or whether it's Tom, as I said, that suddenly celebrates with the children uh, his favorite holiday and comes home and tells the parents about this amazing experience he had. And the next day the parents come to the school and say, what happened? Do you have a new boy in the class or a new girl in the class that suddenly shares with the children our culture when they realize that there is space and value for their own culture, they become supporters of the, of the program and they open up and become engaged. The, the, last, uh, the last step is improving. I decided unless, uh, uh, instead of uh, sharing with you the lessons we have of improvement to share with you a broader step of improvement I would like, I would like to see. And I would actually like to share with you my, our vision towards the end of the talk. Uh, so I think I would say that my vision is, and I'm sure we all share it, to provide all children with childhood experiences that strengthen their cultural identity and empathy towards themselves and others. Furthermore, I would love this first meeting of us to create an international forum of professionals that share this vision and co will collaboratively advance it. Because every child matters. Thank you very much.
I stopped sharing, right? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Ziv, for this uh, really um, eye-opening uh, lecture on, um, on how we can help build empathy and uh, cultural identity among young children. And uh, I love your last call to action of creating an international network of professionals. Uh, and um, I think this is something that, uh, that is really worthy to try and do. So let's really raise raise ourselves to that uh, challenge that you've brought to us. There are a few questions and I would like to actually um, uh, ask and encourage people if they are interested in some questions, if they have specific questions that they would like, please write them in the chat and I will try to get to as many questions as possible um, with the time that we have left. I will ask you the first few questions that uh, we received and, and then we will continue from there. So, um, one of the first questions from the beginning was if you had any persona dolls uh, for children with special needs and disabilities, uh, and if you've had any sort of experience uh, using uh, dolls um, with with who, who have uh, special needs. That's a very good question. I'm, I'm glad it's a, it was raised. As I said at the beginning, uh, we chose amongst the different issues that could be relevant for a persona dolls approach program, we chose to uh, focus on cultural issues. But, but the nice thing about the persona doll approach is that it's very open and very flexible, which means that every one of the dolls can tell a story, not about herself as a disabled child, but about someone in her family, a close friend of hers. So Shahal won't become suddenly a, won't become suddenly a girl in a wheelchair, or Tom will not suddenly become deaf. But, but apparently, and again, this is a story that Tamal uh, shared with us, but apparently Tom has an aunt who's deaf, who's deaf, and her child, meaning Tom's cousin, is the one who translates for the mother uh, from sign language to, to spoken Hebrew. And he often shares with Chacha that with Tom, the experience of uh, dealing with this disability. So every possible issue you can think about, whether it's disabled uh, the children or families with disability, whether it's different kinds of families, whatever, whatever comes into one's mind and feels relevant to discuss with the children can easily be incorporated into the persona adult's lives. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you touched a little bit upon the change of attitudes amongst parents, um, but there is a question if you can go a little bit deeper into what kind of attitudinal changes there were among parents. And if you saw any difference in um, academic and extracurricular activities, participation of outgroup students. Of um, what students? If, if outgroup, children, the, the children that belong to the out group, if they were um, more involved afterwards in extracurricular activities, um, joining, you know, like Hugim, like uh, we would say here. So I'll ask the, I'll answer the second question first. We didn't look into that. We didn't look into extracurricular afternoon activities, but the study from Greece, which I described, actually did look into it and looked deeply into it and looked into both formal and informal education and found that very similar processes happen both in formal educational settings and in informal educational settings. So children were really more open to explore, I would say, to explore things that they were interested in as a result of the very meaningful uh, encounter with Said, the, the persona dolls, and they, and they went through, uh, they went, they advance, I would say, I would say, in their willingness to become part of the of the, uh, activities with the Greek children. So that's regarding the extracurricular activities. I think, by the way, it's a very important issue to look into and to further study. In some countries, for example, and Greece was one of them, it felt more natural and more feasible to start the persona doll, doll approach in a uh, extracurricular afternoon activities. It may be the case for other countries. Again, I said one should characterize the context. 
In Israel, we did it within the state preschools. We do it within the state preschools and train many teachers. Uh, but of course, it has the potential of training or teaching, whether it's a guide of after school activities, whether it's a afternoon a, a activities, whatever. So it really depends on what's, re what's relevant and appropriate for the different cultures. Regarding the, regarding the parents, as I said, parents are, are of course diverse. Parents are of course diverse, but it's very important to include the parents uh, in the process, in the process. And as I said, initially, most of the parents are supportive. One of the things we advise to teachers, and this is a, an important point, is not to start with the most problematic group. So for example, if for, well, if for a certain, in a certain town in Israel, bringing, interestingly, not an Arab girl, not an Ethiopian girl, but being, bringing a religious child is the most challenging issue, we do not recommend bringing that doll first. We recommend bringing first a, a persona doll that, that presents a, somebody who's not, in, a, a, who's not in the preschool or is, but is not a, well known by the children and is, it belongs to a social group that really addresses difficult challenges. For example, a school in a, in a, a big city in Israel would prefer probably to bring the Muslim Arab girl, as I said, than the religious uh, boy. So gradually build the process with the, with the parent so the resentment uh, can really uh, decrease as the parents experience the, that their needs and worldviews are addressed. And only gradually, gradually the teacher can challenge them. Um, so I think that's a very, uh, in some of the uh, contexts, in, uh, in Israel, we actually advise the teachers and actually they, they pick it up themselves. We, we don't really have to advise teachers about what to do. We, are, we kind of resonate with them, their own thoughts and, uh, and ideas. But in some, they really feel the, mo the most important thing is to introduce a persona dolls, like in Greece, that represents the dominant group within the preschool. Whether it's a, even if it's not a dominant group in Israel, to give the the parents a sense of pride in themselves, and once we develop, once they have that, to move on uh, to 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 other groups. Many, not many, but I would say some teachers have, I would say, uh, the experience and the courage. I would say to start from an early stage to um, richly uh, integrate the parents. Some some teachers need more time for that. All 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 teachers engage the parents in one way or another. You can't, they, all teachers realize that it's important to uh, write a letter, send a WhatsApp message uh, or, or other type of message at certain points in the process and uh, update the parents about what's happening and invite them to participate. But some teachers actually engage parents even more. So invite parents to share their experiences with them in one um, Jewish preschool. Uh, in the college where I work, where the, the, the students are, um, some of them are Jewish, some of them are, are Bedouins, the Jewish uh, teacher asked her Arab friend to bring an Arab grandmother dressed in a beautiful, uh, traditional embroidered dress to the preschool to tell the children a folklore story. So there are different uh, ways of uh, engaging the parents. And of course, the teacher, uh, the teachers are. I wanted to say should be, but most of them are sensitive to to the stage. I would say where the parents are, how supportive they are, how open-minded are they, how willing are they, how far are they willing to go, and according to that, they kind of plan and implement a process that gradually helps the parents uh, go through a change of attitude process themselves. So thank you, thank you very much for that for that answer. And it actually leads um, into a new another question, which is uh, with regards sort of to the methodology. You talked about gradually introducing the dolls uh, in the classroom, but can you go a little bit more into detail about uh, how often do you use the dolls? At what age do you introduce them? Um, sort of do you use them for the entire year, or sort of um, 
more practical um, aspect about how, how to use them in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, as I said, the first choice is different uh, amongst teachers regarding who the first persona dog uh, would be. Uh, teachers differ. Teachers differ in the uh, frequency of bringing uh, the persona dog to the class. I would say from uh, once a week um, to, I would say, twice or three times a week. And they also differ in the extent of time they devote to each a persona dolls, and again, the considerations are very, very different. Some teachers would prefer to, uh, to invite one specific persona doll and have her stay in the class for a longer time in order for the children to actually get to know her better and uh, go through a process of significant change of attitudes. Some teachers uh, would prefer the children to be exposed to the diversity, more to the diversity, so would bring, would change, uh, I wouldn't say change, would add new persona dolls uh, more frequently and tell stories about the uh, meetings of, uh, between the persona dolls. They can meet at the zoo, they can meet at the, uh, the mall, they can meet on the beach, and they can do uh, things, things together. So it differs. An important, uh, uh, again, range, I would say. As I said, it's flexible and it's open. An important range is, or differences between teachers is between those who have the persona dolls sessions. So they bring the persona dolls uh, for, uh, to specific sessions, and then they wait till the next time uh, they come to visit again. There are other teachers, there are other teachers who, as you saw, uh, uh, use, <laughs> uh, bring, uh, enjoy, or invite the persona dolls to help the children uh, cope with many, many, many different issues, social, emotional, family issues. And really, uh, we see that they, for children, it's, it's very natural to, to engage or to discuss uh, problematic issues or even fun, fun experiences with the persona doll. So in these preschools, the teacher kind of uh, keeps the persona doll throughout the day, throughout the year. One, one persona doll is invited and the other adds her and the, gradually the, the classroom grows with many, many new friends. Another possibility is to actually integrate into the curriculum, into the curriculum um, events throughout the year that, um, that uh, present the different uh, holidays or customs or habits that represent the different cultural groups or the celebration of all of them. So for example, uh, as I said before, um, celebrating the different holidays, but also in Israel, there's family day, like it's a, an event that is celebrated in preschools. So it's a wonderful opportunity, a wonderful opportunity to invite the persona dolls. We then invite the children and their families to celebrate family day in a intercultural manner. So there, it differs and there's no, I would say there's no one way of doing it. It's not as if you have to do it in a certain way. Again, I think each and every professional knows what's best for her or him. I mean, it, we have to be very attentive to ourselves, do what we feel comfortable with. And of course, what suits the children, the family, the community, it's very, very flexible and very open and the range can be a very wide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I do have a few more questions. We have five more minutes. So when you're talking about flexibility and the range being wide, can you talk a little bit about the teacher training then that happens? You talked a little bit about it, but... Um, Again, that's a very good question. Um, we have identified, and not only us, it's a, a, we learned a lot from other places in the world, we have identified a few components that are important to include in the teacher training process. First of all, the first stage is, a, I would say, personal process. So we invite teachers to think and reflect, I would say, about their own experiences, about their own attitudes towards a, a subgroups in the society they live in, towards a experiences they had of affiliation, of oppression. I can give, uh, and once you invite 
uh, students to share their own experiences, it becomes a, a, it becomes a real opportunity to kind of clean ourselves from our own uh, past experiences, which is really necessary in order to open up and be able to be attentive to, to children, to issues that the children raise. So the first stage should be, and is very helpful to enable the teachers to talk openly and freely about their attitudes, about their experiences. Apparently, most, I would say all of the teachers experienced difficult activities, uh, difficult experiences due to cultural identity and belonging. It's quite amazing that when the opportunity is given for uh, teachers to share these experiences, each and every one of them comes up with things that are surprisingly uh, difficult. So that's a very, very important stage. Uh, and then reflecting or thinking about how they see their role in the process of educating, educating children. Then we go into, again, I'm telling you kind of the outline of the courses. I teach, Tamar teaches it differently. So again, there's a large variety, but I'm just giving you some components and then you can use them freely and in a modular uh, manner. Uh, the next stage often is to teach some uh, theories, theories, uh, multicultural intergroup uh, cultural educational theories. There are many, many, and I think it's important to anchor uh, what teachers do in, uh, in uh, getting to know theories. It might not be important in certain contexts, in certain, uh, certain cult uh, cultures. It might be a, a very, very short step in other cultures and might be more important to immediately go into the actual experiences. So it, it's not a, a must. The, th the third stage or the third component, I, I, I should say, is really what I shared with you very, very briefly here is learning about the development of attitudes towards a, towards a diversity, because it's important that we, that our, our um, curriculum and activities are developmentally appropriate, developmentally appropriate. Uh, and then we uh, give the opportunity of uh, experiencing the persona dolls approach. We teach the principles and we go through the different stages of introducing the different stories and build, allow the teachers to build their own stories. As I said, we do provide the teachers with curricular materials. We do give them examples of stories. We do suggest uh, extra activities like what music they can uh, introduce to the children, what uh, holidays and what habits within the holidays. We provide them with a, a background information about some of the cultures. We help, we help, we provide. We have an, a website which includes uh, some information for the teachers. So we, we train the teachers and we give them the support, uh, the support uh, they need. And we ongoingly, have a reflection sessions, we encourage teachers to document. And we, by that, we also create a learning community, which uh, is important both uh, professionally and emotionally. It's very important and uh, uh, rewarding uh, to be supported by, by peers who share, the, who share both positive, lots of positive experiences and also dilemmas and challenges. Yeah, so that's more or less the, the process. Hey, thank you very much. We have uh, two more questions and I will ask them. They're different, but since we, we are running out of time, I will just ask them together. The first one is, uh, can you um, suggest other tools and methods to enhance social skills and empathy in children? And uh, the second one is a more global question. It was from a participant from Vietnam. Uh, but uh, I'll ask globally if where this Persona Dolls uh, program is happening in the world. And um, if this woman was asking in Vietnam if it's happening, but where, where else also in the world is it happening? Wow, okay. <laughs> Remind me what the first question was. The uh, first question was. It's interesting. And, yeah. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. who, I don't know who asked it, and I, I'm kind of sorry that I don't see the actual faces and don't actually hear the questions. I hope we'll have an opportunity one day because we'll, we'll create this international forum, of course. Um, 
but uh, yes, there are other ways. The, I won't go into kind of emphasize now, emphasizing now that I think you could see what the special uh, contribution of persona dolls is. Persona dolls, when there's no actual face-to-face -face ongoing uh, opportunities to meet each other, they are the closest best, or I would say the second best uh, thing to do. But interestingly, I myself, and we can have a whole different lecture on that, I'm a pedagogical consultant of a book reading program that has similar, <laughs> similar objectives. So we can really have a big talk about that, but book reading is another stream uh, through which similar values can be uh, transmitted to children. There's a very nice, I think, um, approach towards book reading with children, which says that children should, the books that children are exposed to should provide them mirrors, windows, and doors to the world. Mirrors, meaning they should feel that they are visible, that they are mirrored in the books. So in the United States, for example, for many, many years, all the books, and in Israel as well, all the books about were about white, blonde, blue-colored eyed uh, boys and girls. And many, many, many of the American citizens, and again, it was similar in Israel and still is a problem here in Israel, could not really see themselves in the books. If a child doesn't see himself or herself in a book, or over and over again, the message that is transmitted to him is that he doesn't exist in the society. The books, the stories are not about him. The challenges, the characters are not, cannot identify with. Where is he? Where is his culture? Where is his family? It's not existent within the society. So the first thing that a book, books have to do are mirror children's culture. It doesn't have to be always a direct, a, a directly done. I'm, I didn't I think we would, I would be asked about books, but so I don't have books as examples with me right now, but it can be done in, in multiple ways. Once a child feels kind of that he belongs to the community through, through the books, they can open up. They can open up to new cultures. So they can learn about cultures that are in their own society, the windows, windows to, to other cultures. And finally, they are provided with doors to become members of the global uh, society of the world. So that's an example. We, we're running out of time, so I cannot give a, a other examples of streams, but yes, there are other means. Of course, everyone has every stream like that or every kind of media has their own principles and their own everything, like defining of goals, training teachers, selecting, and so on and so forth. But there are, uh, of course, there's nothing like the persona does, but, uh, <laughs> but there are. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great example. Thank you. And what about globally? Where uh, is oh. there a program? And Okay, so one of our dreams, and again, I'm sharing uh, Tamar and uh, Reut share, sh shares this dream with, uh, with me, <clears throat> is to have a conference, an international conference, and to bring together all different uh, professionals, educational, social activists, academics, who actually use the Pesadal approach in their different cultures. As far as we know, there's quite a lot. Uh, South Africa, was one of the first countries to use the uh, persona dolls. The United States used the persona dolls. Singapore, which is not close to Vietnam, but, but they're stereotypically thinking it's somewhere, somewhere in the East. I'm not aware of uh, Vietnam. I'm aware of Northern Ireland. I'm aware of Greece, Turkey, uh, Tamar, any other countries? I'm sure I missed some. I'm sure I missed some. The uh, United Kingdom, did I say? United Kingdom has a big uh, a personal doll organization. Uh, there are probably others which I don't remember now. Um, uh, Serbia, uh, I saw uh, in the list that I received before, before the meeting that there was someone here from Serbia. Uh, Serbia uses the personal dolls. Um, there are quite a few countries that, as I said, should get together and work collaboratively. Because I really think so. I think that when you deal with the big, big goals, you have to work collaboratively. I think that's the key for success. In fact, I think that uh, the real uh, pandemic in the world is not COVID. COVID will pass. COVID will, uh, one time or another, will be, will be after COVID. 
and look how how much international cooperation went into uh, addressing the COVID uh, challenge. So I invite us to regard this uh, pandemic of uh, uh, advancing children's experiences of being valued uh, in their societies and not living in divided and uh, uh, threatening societies as a, as a global challenge. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Zid. Uh, thank you very much for this question period and for this wonderful presentation that you gave. And I'm going to pass uh, the mic now to Yehuda. Thank you, Sarah. I uh, also want to thank uh, Professor Zid for uh, sharing with us her uh, experience. It's an amazing uh, that we all learn out of it. Uh, I also want to thank for all the participants who are around the world that comes in the evenings and the mornings, depending on where you are. We really thank you for coming and attending up to the end. Um, I will close by giving you a reminder to, to follow us through our social media networks. That is Mishaf Carmel Training Center and Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, what I forget, all of the possible social medias. Uh, please follow us. We have another activities in coming weeks uh, online that you might gonna find interesting. So uh, please follow us. And once again, thank you so much for Professor Zeev and Shalom. It was my pleasure. Thank you, you for having us. Can I just add as well that uh, this, this presentation was recorded and uh, Professor Zeev has very generously uh, agreed to share her presentation. There were a few questions about that. So thank you so much uh, for sharing your presentation. We will, we will make sure to have it up on our website as well as this rec recording. And I think as a final uh, saying, I would really like to see how we can build this, net this network that you spoke about. And uh, we will really hope to keep in touch with all the, the participants that are here. Please be in touch with us on ideas on how we can create this network how we can move forward these really important goals and objectives that professors you spoke about and, uh, and continue working together. I want to say just one last sentence before, before we uh, say goodbye. Uh, as uh, Sarah and Yuda said, the presentation will be on the website, not only the recording, and importantly, you can use it for whatever purposes you want. It's not only for your personal kind of uh, um, experience to remember what 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 what, I, what we said, but you can actually take parts of it, present it to whoever you think uh, can enjoy and learn from it. I think this is perhaps the first step in collaborating and sharing our experiences, our knowledge, our uh, values. I would say. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you to everyone. And hope to see you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much.